Good morning. Happy 4th of July. I hope you're doing well and that you have enjoyed a good a bit of fireworks and wherever you were last night, maybe Friday night down on the lake. Uh, it's good to see you this morning. I'm very thankful that we have the freedom to join each other, even digitally. And I know that people are getting tired of digital and we're working our way through that to our hopefully our live opening on July 12th, which will be next Sunday. So stay tuned and make sure that you uh, are aware that we're making those phone calls on Fridays and making sure that the phone tree is going and your email if you have that so that we can stay in touch with you. We're very pleased the way that communication pattern is going and very appreciative of all the volunteers that are helping us to do that. Uh, someone mentioned to me this week that, uh, hey, we're one of the last to return to live worship. And I said, I wasn't aware it was a race. We're just happy that we're taking care of our folks in the way that God is showing us uh, to take care of. So each person who is part of this congregation is important and sacred, and we want to make sure we ensure the safety of our people uh, as well as the spiritual nourishment of our people. So just thank you for that. This morning, uh, I'm going to go to the Gospel of John to the 13th chapter, and I want you, as I read this story, you're going, wait a minute, we're expecting fireworks and, and talks about Montezuma and not his revenge, but anyway, Montezuma and all these kind of things about the 4th of July and independence, and, and we are, and we're gonna, but we're going to put it into a context about the root of freedom. And, of course, everybody sitting there, I remember uh, there was a time that I was doing children's, children's sermons all the time, and the preachers were the worst, were the worst at setting people up for the answer sometimes. But doing a children's sermon, and I was describing, hey, kids, do you know, can you tell me what has a bushy tail and loves to climb trees and likes to eat nuts with his hands and can jump from limb to limb? And a little fella sitting there said, you know, I know the answer is Jesus, but that sure does sound like a squirrel to me. Well, yes, the answer is Jesus to our longing and our question and the root of our freedom is really in Christ. The one who has been set free in Jesus, whom the Son has set free, is free indeed. But I want us to, to look this morning on this day when words of independence and word of freedom are often shouted and and uh, from everything from wearing masks to using san hand sanitizer to where people meet the word freedom is being thrown around in ways that is confusing at, at the very least what do people mean by that is it licensed to do what i want is it something that says i have no restrictions that me as an independent thinking, rational human being has the ability, if I have the ability, to move and have the power to do what I want to do according to my own agenda. So there's a lot of news and there's a lot of discussion about how freedom is defined, how it is um, codified when we live in society with each other in community. Everything from HOAs, I'm going to put up whatever building I want to, wherever I want to, it's my property, uh, to even fussing down at, in, in the, the trailer hood where we have the north, the Parsons North, about where people can put their boats and how old you have to be to drive a golf cart. These are interesting times. But as as Jesus followers, and, I, and again, I just say welcome to all the Waitsboro saints and all the free range followers of Jesus around. When we adopt and, and, and are adopted by God and we submit ourselves to Jesus, there's this notion that we don't belong to ourselves anymore. So I want us to enter this text by one, recognizing that Jesus redefines use of power because certainly if anyone had the freedom to do what he wanted to do 
it was Jesus who deemed, as we talked a couple of weeks ago, equality with God, not something to be grasped, but emptied himself. He certainly had the power to do whatever he wanted to do. But we're going to see how he then shows us what true freedom looks like and how that impacts us as Jesus followers. Uh, I was asked just recently, how do you compartmentalize all this stuff in your head? Well, I, I want to, to say first and foremost that as I enter into the text that, that we read together and study together, that I want to, to lay aside Harry's agenda. I, I want to lay aside everything that I've brought to the table at that moment and, and really let God's word wash over me and let it challenge me. And we'll see how that works in this story from the 13th chapter of John. Jesus is gathered with his disciples and he's going to be sharing his last meal with them, what we know as the, the upper room last supper is the night before he's crucified and he's with his disciples. And it picks up with this um, very, very interesting summation. It was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, which I think is so such a beautiful thing to know how to, to live this life with an end in mind. That, that goal, that, that, that end that Jesus knew was going to be coming, he, he didn't like the path he was going to have to go through. In fact, we would see him pray in the Garden of Gethsemane just a few hours later. Father, if it's, if, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. Meaning, I, I really don't want to embrace the nails and the suffering. But nevertheless, he said, let your will be done. And it was knowing where the end was that allowed him the strength to get to that end. And I, I hope that you and I can begin to take on that eternal sense of mindset that whatever we're going through right now, with all the political morass and all the confusion in our society and all the the debating one way or the other, that if, if you're a Jesus follower, we can go through this because we know that we're going to return to the Father, even as Jesus did, and that was a promise to him and it's a promise to us. But let's keep going. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now was going to show them the full extent of his love. And we're going to see this meet it out not only at the cross but even even in his next very next action the evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted judas iscariot son of simon to betray jesus jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power and that he had come from god and was returning to god so there was a security in this moment he gets up from the table he knows that all authority all power that's what a lot of people assume freedom really is. Hey, I've got all authority, I've got all power to do what I want to do. But listen, let's, let's look at this. So he got up to the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, You don't realize it now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And Lord, then Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my, my head as well. And I can I can't help but see Jesus smiling, going, person who has had a bath and he's only washed his feet. His whole body is clean. You're clean. You're clean. But not every one of them. For he knew he was who was going to betray him. And that is why he said not everyone 
was clean. And when he had finished washing his feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place, and he asked him a question. Again, I, I return to this theme, this theme oftentimes in, in preaching and teaching, and that's God asking us questions. Do you understand what I've done for you, Jesus asked? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. For that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than this master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Friends, this is, this is a word for our times. When people are trying to recreate Jesus in the, the image of a political king and force him to take his kingdom, even as Judas, it is theorized, was trying to do to force his hand to be the king of Israel, we likewise are trying often to, to make Jesus be a power authority. Even when we try to talk about his sovereignty, we put it in political terms, and Jesus is going to show, say, let me show you the full extent of my love for you. Let me show you the full extent. And you and I, and I'll just speak for me, are so often like Peter. No, you're not going to wash my feet, Jesus. You see, for most of us, we are so trained and so enculturated to be independent and so um, taught that we should pull our own, ourselves up our own bootstraps and that we should rely on no one that, and I'm just going to speak a little bit, I can't speak for the women, I can speak for a lot of the men that, that I come into contact with, have a problem with giving their lives to Christ because this whole thing of putting myself under authority of someone else rubs against that notion of freedom that we have grown to, to not question. That freedom is simply my ability, my authority, my power to do what I want to do. And to give that over to someone else is a threat. And I think at the heart of some of that with Peter is that the heart of the same thing that's the heart of us. And that is, it's not easy to look into our lives and ask the question, is there something I need to die to in my own life that is an obstacle keeping me from the very best and from the relationship that Jesus would desire for me? You see, Jesus had already told Peter, I'm going to build my church on you, brother. You're the rock. He'd already kind of given him, given him that glimpse, like I said, from I know where I'm going, I know where you're going, I know how it's going to end. But Peter, like us, because he's human, still wrestles with that sense of authority, that sense of being told what to do, when to do it, and how to live under that authority. Now one of the things that pushes us is the same thing that pushed Peter. Lord, no. Remember a couple of weeks ago when we were in Caesarea Philippi and he was camping with the boys and, and Jesus said, you know, I am the Messiah. You're right. Peter had blurted out, you're the Christ, the God, the Messiah. And then Jesus went on to tell him that the Messiah was going to have to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die. And Peter had the chutzpah to stand up and say, God forbid. No, that can't happen to you. He had his own agenda. Here. No. You're not going to baptize me. But Peter hears the words of Jesus. Unless I do this, Peter, unless I do this, you have no part with me. You see, that, that was Jesus saying, Peter, unless you submit, unless you give your career goals, unless you put your political agenda under my authority, if you put, unless you put your 
family under my authority, unless you put your job under my authority, you put your finances under my authority, unless you put your whole being under my authority, unless you let me wash you, you have no part in me. I think it's funny, and the reason I say I, I can see Jesus smiling is because then Peter goes, oh, okay, well, uh, then just, like, wash all of me. <laughs> just bathe me off. Everything, hands, everything. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if we could wake up each morning or before we put our head on the bed at night, wouldn't it be just wonderful if we could, teach, if we could just take a shower, get in the bathtub, and have our guilt, our remorse, just washed away. I'm just going to turn on extra hot, I'm going to have the shower rain head, and I'm going to get in there, and I, you know, I've got bad thoughts, or I've hurt a friend, I'm just going to, I'm just going to let this happen, and sure enough, take a bath, and your guilt goes away. See, Peter was missing the point again. Jesus was redefining power. Remember that, that verse that said that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve? This is, this is the challenge for us in the, in the 21st century church. That I've been part of churches, I've been part of congregations that, that, that were more like a cafeteria. How can this how can this thing serve me rather than, God, what are you calling me to do in the midst of this congregation? This community. And it begins with also not just what is God, what, what is it God needs to reveal to me that I need to die to, but also part of that is letting God be God. Jesus said, you've called me teacher, Rabbi, Rabuni, and they've learned the the, the message of God, they've learned the teachings of God, but they've also learned something about his divinity, his, uh, Jesus' own divinity, because Jesus said, and you call me Lord. And that's a wonderful Greek word, kurios, that he uses, and it's one that was used in the Old Testament when the Greek was, um, when the Hebrew was translated into Greek, it was called the Septuagint. The word Lord was translated from the Hebrew to the Greek, and it was kurios. And so when Jesus says, you, you're, you're recognizing me, you're calling me Lord, in other words, you get it, you have right doctrine, you understand theologically, you understand spiritually who I am. But now, you have to understand what that Lord is about. It, it, it's just not power and authority to do what I want. Jesus said, I, I, I'm showing you now how to define lordship and servanthood in the light of following the Father. I don't know if you've ever been part of a foot washing service. I have, and I've conducted them on mission trips, out of the country, mission trips that I've, I've helped to direct through a ministry called Saukahatchee Summer Service in South Carolina. Did that for over 20 years. And every, every, every Friday night we would hold a, a communion service and all the young people would share and we would have uh, 100 or more young people and adults after they'd worked all week in these hot, sweaty conditions. And, and I would tell them all to take off their shoes before the, the communion service. And I remember the first couple of years that I did this, the overwhelming response. And I heard so many people say, just like Peter, there was something disarming when I would kneel at someone's feet and I would bathe their feet with cool water and, and I would see tears flowing and recognition of why me, why, and this is embarrassing, and this is odd, and, but don't you think Jesus knew that? You see, the, mid, the, the middle, uh, Middle Eastern hospitality code required that a host would 
provide water for the washing of the feet of the travelers because nobody had shoes, they had sandals or bare feet. And so one of the greatest gifts you could give someone coming into your home was the cool water. But it was always a servant, the faceless, nameless servant who bathed the feet. And Jesus is saying, I'm the one. And he would say, and now by example, you should be the one. This didn't become so real to me until a particular incident happened in the church I was serving that one of my very best friends in that church, we were hunting buddies, we fished together, we hung out, uh, did his daughter's wedding, and he was in the church and he was the head of the trustees at the time, and it was a smaller church, so people didn't rotate in and out off of committees, they just continued to be uh, up, uploaded and reused over and over again, but he kept saying, you know, I, you need to find somebody else. I've been in the trustees forever and I've been doing it this long. You need to find somebody else. And what God taught me is if somebody says this over and over and over, I'll ask them twice, are you sure? And if they tell me, I'm sure, I'll take them at their word that they're serious about that. And so we found another person who would take over the trustees and his feelings were hurt. And there was a little grain of resentment dropped into the midst of our relationship. He didn't believe that I would take him serious and I didn't believe he was getting hurt because he'd assured me and we both kind of bowed up about that. Like, well, I'm not going to give in to that. You were wrong. I was wrong. You were wrong. No. And we would go to men's breakfast and we would get bacon out of the same pan, but we wouldn't talk to each other. I was just as guilty. And I was feeling prideful. Like, I'm in the right. You told me. We did it. And, you, and he was hurt. And one night, while teaching this passage during Lent, the time of the season before Easter, his wife played piano and she just grieved that our friendship was bent. It wasn't broken, but it was bent and it was frayed. And you could feel it in the church. And one night when reading this and teaching on this, and his wife had played the piano that night, God just convicted me that I needed to go and leave the book and leave the congregation that night and go see my friend Roy. And I rode down the road, he only lived a mile and a half from me, and I rode down the road and I came up to his door and I knocked and he said, come on in. He didn't know it was me and when I did, you could see the stern look and surprise on his face and and I just said, Roy, I've been wrong. And the God's really convicted me that I've been wrong carrying this root of resentment, this root of bitterness, this hardness in my own heart. When Jesus was was even washing, I want you to, I don't want you to miss this. He had he had actually washed Judas' feet before Judas left. And I went over and I bent down next to him and I cried and I washed his feet, symbolically, but washed his feet. And God touched his heart and my heart. You see, one of the, the things that Jesus wants us to understand is that it is in humility, it is humbling ourselves before God and each other that is the real power. That's when we're really, really, really free. When we're not concerned about our own status or position or if we really are in the right or not, but whether or not this person's whole and has the access to the gospel and to the free message of Jesus himself. And we were able to repair because God stepped into the middle of it. 
I don't know where you are this morning, this July 4th, what notions of freedom you may be imagining or in your own bitterness sometimes maybe thinking that you've been hurt or mistreated or in some way have been forgotten or neglected and that your notion of freedom is that you should be able to do what you want. And Jesus is saying, no, let me wash you. And when you have felt the cleansing power of the, the washing and of the grace of Jesus Christ, go do that for somebody else who's badly, badly in need of it. Many years ago, there was a movie called Pay It Forward, and it's a, it's a classic old movie where a, a, a seventh grade teacher asked the, his class, choose something that will change the world. And a young man decided he was going to do something that was so extraordinary to three people that it was something that would never, ever have happened to them. And I'm not going to tell you the end of it. But the only thing that he was asking was when they had come into their freedom, that they can't pay it back. They needed to pay it forward. And in Jesus humbling himself in this way, he's saying, that which I've done for you, now you do for others. I pray that the independence and the joy and the freedom of this day, not only in a, in a real sense, rests on the lives of others who've sacrificed themselves, but we start to understand that this freedom carries a responsibility, a response ability, that we're able to respond and do what Jesus has asked us to do. I pray you have a great day. God bless you. And Lord willing, we'll see you live next week.